Lauren Downing Peters is a PhD candidate uh, at Sto the Fashion Studies Institute at Stockholm University. She is really inspiring, I think, in a lot of her work. She's really paving the way to look at the history of the plus size fashion industry, an area that I think has been really begging for research. And so it's my pleasure to introduce her and her, the title of her paper, I hope she hasn't changed it, is Dressing, Mar Dressing Smart, Looking Slender, Stoutwear and the Discourse of Fitting In, 1915 to 31. Okay, uh, thanks Emma. Uh, so first of all, I just want to extend a sincere thank you both to you, Emma, but also to the entire team at the museum at FIT for putting on such an important exhibition and now symposium and for including me in the process. It's truly been a privilege to be able to take a peek behind the curtains and glimpse how an exhibition comes together, but it's also been wonderful to bear witness to the enthusiastic public and critical response uh, that this exhibition has received. As several have said today, the exhibition is not only timely, it's also a game changer. On a personal note, however, I just want to stress what an honor it's been to get to know Emma, both personally and professionally, over the past year. At both our board meetings as well as at bars, Emma and I have been engaging in a constantly evolving dialogue about the power that the fashion industry wields in constructing and consecrating bodily ideals an experience that has been to the benefit of my own research as a PhD student, but which I hope has also been helpful for Emma too. Through the lens of fashion history, our shared aim has been to provide a footing for contemporary debates and controversies surrounding the representation of non-normative bodies in fashion. Among them, an issue that we returned to time and again was this issue of figure flattery. Indeed, it's an idea that underpins the exhibition, but is also one that's been at the back of my own mind throughout the course of my research. For my talk today, I'm going to attempt to deconstruct and thereafter put back together this very much taken for granted construct of figure flattery. In doing so, I'm gonna take a leap back in time to look at the earliest days of the plus size fashion industry and specifically the discourses that surrounded the design and manufacture of so-called stoutware between the years 1915 and 1930 or a period which spans the, the industry's emergence, but also its demise amid the economic strains of the Great Depression. Before doing so, however, I will f set the stage by first presenting some examples that illuminate just how deeply we take for granted the idea that our clothing should flatter. Take, for example, this image which I captured from the Lane Bryant website in 2013. This pop-up was the first thing that customers encountered whenever they navigated to the website. It was designated a virtual stylist, and the program asked the customer a number of questions about her body, including her height, her weight, and as you can see here, her body size. At the conclusion of the survey, the stylist would then provide the consumer with a dozen or so carefully curated garments that would help flatter her figure. I found this remarkable for a number of reasons, not least of which being the fact that although the program was designed with good intentions to take some of the guesswork out of shopping, I realized that it also placed constraints on the consumer's agency. Rather than asking the woman about her color preferences, her favorite fashion trends, or even her fashion icons, the problem, or the program rather, somewhat problematically focused on altering the very appearance of her body. Indeed, I began to wonder, what did it even mean to flatter the figure? Although definitions of figure flattery are somewhat scarce in the fashion literature, the concept may be linked with how we use dress to fit in amongst our peers and within society at large. As the sociologist Joanne Entwistle, whom you heard from earlier today, has written, dress is the medium through which the flesh is transformed into something recognizable and meaningful to a culture, and are also the means by which bodies are made decent, appropriate, and acceptable within specific contexts. Indeed, as Entwistle has written elsewhere, Human bodies are fundamentally dressed bodies, and bodies that flout the most basic conventions of dress are subject to rejection and ridicule. An easy way to illustrate this point is through the example of the bikini. While these two iconic strips of fabric are completely conventional attire for swimming and sunbathing, 
It would be wholly inappropriate, for example, to wear a bikini to a dentist appointment. <laughs> However, all bodies are embroiled within webs of power that determine which means of dressing are appropriate in particular contexts. Some bodies are subject to more minute forms of policing. For instance, the policing of fat women's bodies in American culture is something of a cherished national tradition. I'm sure we're all familiar with the phrase fat shaming or the practice of judging or outwardly humiliating someone based on their perceived excess weight. While some might argue that fat shaming is a marginal practice, largely relegated to the dark corners of the internet where so-called trolls deride images of plus size models, something that Lauren Chan actually spoke to earlier today. Dr. Charlotte Cooper, a prominent fat activist and scholar, has pointed out that the behavior is both widespread and normalized within our culture. Case in point is the so-called headless fatty phenomenon, a term which Dr. Charlotte Cooper uh, coined herself. Uh, she describes this as the news media's tendency to illustrate stories about the obesity ep epidemic with photos of unwitting fat people with their heads cropped out for anonymity. These pervasive images, she argues, strip the fat person of her agency, medicalize her, and turn her body into an object of disgust. However, in her analysis, Dr. Cooper actually largely ignores the matter of dress. And what I think is so interesting and evocative and problematic about these images is the manner in which the wearer's clothing seems to nestle into the folds of her flesh, becoming one with the body and highlighting all of those unsavory bits that we've been trained to conceal and hide through clothing and undergarments. Indeed, the act of accentuating fat rolls or proudly brandishing cellulite are deeply subversive ones that reject notions of decency and good fit. Just think about how women who dare, or rather fat women who dare wear a bikini are in public are celebrated today as hashtag brave. That being said, a body can be fat and even celebrated as beautiful so long as it is tight, contained, and with firm margins. Plus size models, for instance, look less like these headless fatties than they do enlarged versions of the slender ideal. This policing of the fat woman's body, however, is certainly nothing new. The notion that previous generations venerated female curves has been somewhat over-romanticized, both within popular culture, but also within fashion historical texts. Certainly, more overtly curvaceous or womanly silhouettes have fallen in and out of style over the decades. However, outright fatness, or the abomination of the waist, at least since at least the early modern period, has been a source of great personal stigma. Especially since the late 19th century, however, contemporary ideas about fatness and weight were beginning to congeal, and as such, the fat female body increasingly came to exist as an abject corollary to the slender ideal. As you can see in the two examples here on the screen, when the stout woman appeared within the fashion media at all, hers was a body around which almost exclusively diet and exercise products and reducing corsets proliferated, something that continues to this day. She did not appear in articles and editorial content, but was instead relegated to the classified section alongside advertisements for depilatories and deodorants. Indeed, within the fashion media in particular, fat was something to be feared, and the stout woman, as she was known, was a subject of mockery, mockery and caricature. This point is perhaps best illustrated by an article that appeared in a January 1923 issue of the Philadelphia Inquirer in which the great French couturier, Paul Poiret, somewhat incongruously weighed in on the plight of the stout woman whom he diminished as hopeless. As he told the Daily Newspaper, fashion designers do not pay much attention to fat women because they are the infirm among the fashionable. Their case is not for the dress designer, it is for the physician. Poiret's sentiment was shared widely, widely across the industry, from the highest echelons of French couture to the streets of New York's garment district. As a result, even as American fashion was growing increasingly democratic, and as Americans of all socioeconomic backgrounds could increasingly consult a mail order catalog or walk into a department store and afford to buy a well-fitting garment off the rack, stout women were largely excluded from this essential experience of modernity. However, stout wear manufacturers were unfettered by the idea that fat women were hopeless and therefore sought to redress this imbalance. Within the professional media in the early 20th century, commentators reported that stout wear was primed to become one of the most lucrative subsectors of the, of the burgeoning ready-to-wear trade. Indeed, as one 1915 women's wear article bluntly titled, How Many Fat Women in Your Town reported, stout wear is a desirable trade to have. 
The poor big deers have been so generally unable to get things to wear that they are not at all critical when they get what is coming to them, and they buy without all the finicky demands that are made on us by normally sized customers. In spite of the almost breathless tone that women's wear takes in discussing the profitability of stout wear, the article and accompanying illustration tell a different story, one which points to how the fashion industry both tapped into but also fomented fat stigma in the early 20th century. Indeed, in these early articles, which appeared mostly within the industry, industry press, like Women's Wear Daily, and therefore safe from the prying eyes of consumers, stout women were depicted as larger than life and in some cases as monstrous. Here, for example, an endless mob of stout women is rendered literally larger than life, their heads with their piggish faces and jowls scraping the sills of the building's second story windows, and their gigantic bodies clogging an urban thoroughfare. Elsewhere within the professional media, it was estimated that over one-third of the female buying public was stout. However, when stoutware entrepreneurs looked at these figures, they did not see a hopeless population as Poiré did, nor did they see an unhealthy one. They saw dollar signs. Indeed, as this advertisement from the Svelte Line dress, Stout Dress Company so aptly put it, the stout woman is worth her weight in gold to you. Sorry, this thing's very finicky. Um, seizing on this opportunity quite early, Albert Malson was one of the principal innovators of stoutware design, and an outsized and outspoken figure in the industry, even from its earliest days. Malson, who was trained in Germany as a mechanical engineer, emigrated to the United States, and soon thereafter met a young Lithuanian immigrant named Lena Himmelstein Bryant, who had a small but successful maternity wear business in Harlem, which would go on to be one of the largest and most successful plus-size retailers in the United States. Lane Bryant. The couple were married in 1909 and went into business together soon thereafter. Noting the corporeal similarities between the pregnant body and the stout body, Malson extended his wife's business into the realm of stoutware, and unfortunately in doing so eclipsed his wife as the public face of the company for a period. Malson argued that it was not the stout woman's body per se that made, it, that made her hopeless, but rather that the problem could be attributed to imprecise fits and faulty pattern cutting systems. Issues in sizing, he estimated, cost both consumers and the industry millions of dollars every year in unnecessary alterations. In order to solve the problem of fit, at least for women who had been neglected or sized out of these nascent systems, Malson undertook a survey of over 3,000 stout women. Thereafter, he conceived of a new sizing system that was based on the idea that stout women's bodies, unlike those of slender women, did not fall into a single category, but rather into three categories the full busted type, the flat busted type, and the stout all over type. In these articles, Malson's preoccupation was decidedly on fixing the problem of fit, a noble endeavor. However, he soon trained his sights on the matter of design. In a series of articles published somewhat later in the Richmond Times Dispatch, Malson articulated a new design philosophy, suggesting that dressmakers were generally neglecting certain well-known scientific laws and instead rendered the stout woman's dress in a bland, monochromatic palette. As a result, these plain dress designs, he argued, merely made stout women more conspicuous and thereby appear fatter. Zooming in a bit on this illustration in the lower register, you can see how Nelson suggested that the skillful application of lines could actually make stout women appear less fat. While on the left, the woman is made to appear larger due to the plainness of her dress, the four gowns on the right are said to exemplify how the application of upward thrusting lines has the effect of exaggerating the wearer's height and diminishing her overall girth. When asked where he found his design inspiration, Nelson claimed to have derived these principles from a highly unlikely source high Gothic architecture. <laughs> Indeed, as Malson's longtime biographer explained in a special promotional pamphlet that was published by the company in 1950, Malson believed that the architects of the great Gothic cathedrals have produced in masonry the same effects which stout people should strive to produce in their clothes, height, slenderness, and airy grace. Leaving behind the fact that Malson is quite literally equating stout women with buildings, what is interesting to note here is how much the discourse of stoutware design actually drew upon adjacent fields of cultural production, such as architecture and art, as a rational justification for slenderizing the stout woman's physique. Similar justifications could be glimpsed elsewhere across the fashion media, too. In a series of instructional articles published in women's wear somewhat later in the summer of 1924, 
Carl and Wernz of the Academy of Fine Arts Chicago described basic art principles derived from the writings of Gestalt psychologists that could be applied to stoutware design to affect an appearance of smartness. By applying to dresses certain line and optical illusions that could trick one into overestimating a woman's height by drawing the eye upward instead of outward, Wernz argued that a body could be made to appear more slender. Likewise, in a special article that appeared in Vogue in December 1923, the artist and costumer, Leon Baxt, described in his own words how he had come to appreciate the more serious ramifications of the art of costuming, and especially the ability to, quote, hide imperfections without correcting the incorrigible. In an illustration that accompanied the editorial, which you can see in the lower right-hand side, Baxt demonstrated this notion through side-by-side -side illustrations that showed the slimming effects of vertical lines and what he called the disastrous effects of his horizontal ones on the stout body. The parallels between these various conversations are undeniable and also point to just how pervasive the slenderizing imperative of stoutware design actually was at this time. Within the sphere of the new genre of self-help literature in the early 20th century, home economists penned style guides that instructed women on how to fashion a more slender appearance at home and through their own wardrobes. In her 1924 book, Dress and Look Slender, for instance, Jane Warren Wells described how, through the application of Gestalt principles such as the Mueller lion illusion, a common optical trick, a straight line could, could either be accentuated or shortened by the lines that run outward from it, which you can see here on the left. In the accompanying illustrations, these principles manifested in the addition of accessories, taller hats, or the application of geometric line details directly to the dresses themselves that actually reproduced the illusion. Beyond the fashion media, the slenderizing discourses of stoutware also manifested in the design and creation of actual garments. Although the record of surviving large size dress is scanty at best and non-existent at worst, as you can see in this slide here, these tenets also materialized in the, in the design of real garments. Indeed, as you can see, especially in the rightmost dress, for example, the stout woman's height is made to be exaggerated through the careful application of vertical lines. Herein, it is possible to glimpse the productive power of fashion discourse and how it imprinted upon and actually gave shape to the body itself. The slenderness imperative just wasn't an ideal. These scientific discourses actually materialized in the creation of garments that were explicitly designed to alter the appearance of the stout woman's body. These design discourses did not, however, emerge from or exist in a vacuum. The early 20th century saw the birth of what Mike Featherstone has deemed the self-preservationist ethos of consumer culture, through which people came to believe that they could transform and improve their appearances through body work and through the practice of consumption. In a brief 20-year window at the beginning of the century, tolerances for fat, especially amongst women, grew ever narrower, even as women were increasingly casting off their stiff Victorian corsetry. Indeed, replacing corsets were new and at times desperate means to permanently eradicate fat, and what Valerie Steele has famously described as the internalization of the corset. These included diet and exercise, of course, but also methamphetamine-derived diet pills and, perhaps most oddly, medieval-looking rubber weight-reducing girdles and chin straps, which women were told they could wear and then permanently sweat and rub fat away, a variety of which you can see pictured here. And I should also note that down, or rather across the street in the exhibition, there is uh, a rubber girdle on display. However, it dates slightly later to the 1930s, but it's really interesting to see. Within this context, scientific design was regarded as being more modern and thereby more effective than more time-consuming and at times dangerous means of, re of physically reshaping and slenderizing the body. Indeed, this slenderness imperative was deeply ingrained, if not fundamental, to the discourse and practices of stoutware design, so much so that it was almost entirely taken for granted that stoutware should have a function beyond merely fitting the body, protecting the body from the elements, or looking fashionable. And um, I think this idea of function is actually a really interesting one that merits um, deeper investigation, especially after some things that Grace was saying. You know, what is the function of our dress, and is fashionability itself a function? It's an interesting thought. This emerged from the deeply held cultural belief that the stout body was large, unruly, and was in need of containment and control in a culture that incre increasingly venerated a naturally slender body, body ideal. 
As, the cart as these cartoons from Vogue demonstrate so well, the stout woman's body was one that was regarded as literally out of sync with the architectures and rhythms of modern life. In the one on the left, a woman of so-called generous proportions is depicted overflowing from the cabin of a small automobile, while in the one on the right, a stout woman on the far right is depicted as literally larger than the seat in which she sits, the straps of her delicate chemise dress straining at her robust shoulders. The slenderness imperative touched every level of fashion practice within the stoutware industry, from the design and manufacture of stoutware to the point at which women dressed themselves in the privacy of their own homes. The discourse of stoutware design not only determined the appearance of garments for larger women, but also dictated their dress practices. Indeed, these conversations were not only being had behind closed doors amongst a rarefied group of manufacturers and designers. The idea that stoutware should slenderize was both widely circulated and accepted. As you can see here, Lane Bryant was unabashed about this point in their marketing. On the left, Lane Bryant explicitly advertises their wares as slenderizing fashions for stout women on the cover of their 1924 and 1925 catalog, while the latter two loudly signal to the stout woman with the phrase, if you are not slender, let Lane Bryant make you appear more slender. To summarize, within this context, stoutware existed as a container for the flesh something that created firm margins and which made the fat female body both more recognizably feminine, but also more modern. Although in this very body positive moment in which we find ourselves, plus size fashion manufacturers and retailers would never use such forthright and at times outright offensive language, the slenderness imperative of stoutware design nevertheless has its corollary in an idea with which I open this presentation, figure flattery. Indeed, in contemporary fashion discourse, the slenderness imperative manifests in more subtle and perhaps more insidious ways, with much of the blame actually being turned back around onto the industry itself. Spanx, for instance, have been celebrated as, and appropriated as a feminist foundation invented by women and for women for creating a smooth look under clothing, and which liberates the active modern woman from the antiquated and constricting girdles that her grandmother wore. More recently, Lane Bryant and I apologize if there are any Lane Bryant designers or representatives in the audience. I feel like I've really been laying into the company today. <laughs> um, Lane Bryant has been touting their so-called power pockets as a revelation in denim that are said to sculpt and smooth the plus-size woman's errant curves without the pain, expense, and struggle of wearing conventional foundations. As this image captured from the Lane Bryant website earlier this week suggests, their power pockets jeans integrate mes mesh paneling technology to, quote, control the tummy and keep, quote, everything under wraps without feeling like you're in a vice. While much has certainly changed in the fashion industry in the last century, as you can see, a lot has remained stubbornly the same. While plus size women might not be wearing dresses upon which gestalt optical illusions and tenets of Gothic architecture have been applied, the science of slenderizing is now literally sewn into the fabric of their dress. Just as in the early 20th century, it seems that the principal goal when dressing as a fat woman is to make their body appear more slender. However, we could even go so far as to say that the concept of figure flattery is integral to the dress practices of not only plus size women, but of all women who have been encultured to use their clothing to hide, cinch, and pinch their unruly and deviant curves into submission. To quote the philosopher Michel Foucault, discourses do not merely designate or provide a language for talking about an object. Rather, they systematically form the objects of which they speak. And another way to put this quite simply is that language is power. Indeed, as Foucault writes in his canonical text, Discipline and Punish, power produces, it produces reality, it produces domains of objects and rituals of truth. With regard to the present conversation, both in the early 20th century as now, the discourse of figure flattery the discourses of figure flattery do not merely establish beauty standards or the illusory ideals to which we all strive through dress, diet, and exercise. Rather, figure flattery is a power discourse that quite problematically also creates the conditions through which we come to know the fat female body as deviant and other. Um, and as a final thought and kind of going off script, um, today's been interesting for a number of reasons, but not least of which being the manner in which it has revealed how history always repeats itself and how in fashion everything is always, um, everything old rather, is always new again. And with that idea, I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.